Hello all of you beautiful people, Jules here from Live and Let's Dice and I have a very special video for you today because recently I was invited by the developers over at Steamforged Games to come and try out their new board game Bard songs. What they did is they taught me all of the rules, they set me up with a character, and I went about hacking and or slashing inside a dungeon. And you know what? It's left me feeling pretty annoyed. Oh, not because of the game being bad in any sense of the word, but because I'm about to run out of all of my positive phrases, adjectives, and other lexicon, because telling you how good this game is, is going to drain me. Lest we not forget, Steamforged are the same people that brought Resident Evil 2 to life in board game form, and are doing the same with Resident Evil 3, taught us the very meaning of crushing brutality with the Dark Souls miniature and card game, and burned my bloody face off with blistering combat thanks to their Devil May Cry experience. In short, Steamforged knows how to make brilliantly realised and captivating board games, and they pay respect to their source material but at the same time forge ahead with bold and interesting ideas. And acting as a sort of culmination of their efforts is Bardsung, which is a game for up to five people in which you dive into dungeons and bash in monsters' faces or anyone who looks at you the wrong way in search of treasure and other magical items. And what it does is it cherry picks some of the best features of their other titles and still adds in new and interesting content that is at once easy to get to grips with but so utterly enthralling that I literally had to ask the devs to let me play for longer in our online session. The aim of the game is to take on missions, delve into the forgotten ruins of enemy strongholds, and make off with a fat amount of loot and treasure. Now, depending on how long you want the play session to be, you can either declare the game will be played lengthways, widthways, or diagonally. The reason that this is so important is because the dungeons are procedurally generated, meaning that the size of the board that you're playing on reflects how big the dungeon could end up getting. Each time a party member moves to a new area, they draw either a corridor or room card and use that to build the dungeon in front of them. But the twist is, is that while it might make a lot of sense to head right to the other side of the board and escape, treasure cards are positioned on the map itself, which your dungeon needs to overlap in order to flip over, meaning that there's a brilliant balance of risk and reward throughout. What struck me straight away was how quickly this game can be set up. It's clear that the devs have approached this with the sense of, let's make sure that once the box is open, you are playing within a matter of minutes. For example, all player cards have the starting stats and equipment printed on the back, so once you've picked your party, there's no issue in getting their gear together. Another good example is how the game addresses who will fight first in battles. Each round, the player's cards, along with any monster cards, are shuffled and then dealt out. This order from left to right dictates who is going to go first in battle, and there are spells, abilities, and tricks that you can use to manipulate your position on this timeline. This means that if you come up against a particularly troublesome enemy, enemy, then why not ask your friend to cast a spell that will fix you in place or bump you up that timeline, meaning that you can act before the monster and get the damage done. I love this shakeup to the regular Roll20 initiative formula, because now it means that anyone can be called on to be a hero, and that fluid dynamic is really, really engaging. It's exactly what you want in a party-focused experience, and there are many heroes that make up said party, from mages who can throw lightning bolts and generate a common resource called Fate Points, which I'll touch on in a minute, to whirling dervishes of death and destruction that love bashing, biting, and brawling. Yeah, no guesses as to who I played in this. <laughs> Each character comes with abilities that reflect their playstyle, be they able to duplicate the damage done to an enemy onto another foe in the same area, or jump high over enemies and out of trouble, pushing foes back as they do so, which sets up other players for a combo attack. Now, some skills require you to spend fate points, which are earned through beating challenges or by fulfilling certain conditions, and they become an invaluable currency, offering up powerful abilities on the fly. But the twist is, is that you can never have more fake points than you have members of your party, so a maximum would be four. And suddenly when you limit them, it becomes much more stressful as to how you're going to use them, and you really need to work together as a team to get the most out of them. Battles are fluid, meaning that enemies and players will constantly be shuffling positions and diving into tank hits for allies and then set up for something truly devastating with another player. Yet the enemies, they're not just gonna sit there and take a beating, as they are numerous, and thanks to what could be described as card-based AI, each foe follows a certain logic tree which determines what it does in any given situation. Now, knowing what enemy tree that you're going to be fighting means that you and your party can start planning on how to manipulate this to your best interests. But there's one thing that I learned very, very quickly. They are numerous, they hit hard, and never, under any circumstances, split the party. It's just bad news for everyone. <laughs> 
Now, some enemies even have special skills, such as being able to drag players back towards their unholy allies, or others will give you roll disadvantage, meaning that you have to roll 2d20 and pick the lowest, and you know what, some are just so bloody horrible to look at that I don't want to give them space in my nightmares. And that's before you add in the absolute unmitigated horrors that are wandering monsters. You see, after the end of each battle round, you'll roll a dice, and if you're unlucky enough, then one of these incredibly tough, really, really resilient monsters that give you no trouble pressure for defeating them will arrive to join the battle. It's a bloodbath. Now, the rooms that you fight in also have special rules, each of which is defined randomly by a set of cards. In our case, we drew a card that meant that for every enemy that we killed, we actually got an extra fate point. In others, it will ask you to make skill checks in order to pass challenges. In short, there's never a dull moment. Bard Sung always has you doing something, and it minimizes downtime and drag, and that just maximizes how much fun you're getting out of the experience. The artwork is fantastically detailed as well and full of character, and if the 3D renders of the models that I played with are anything to go by, this is going to be a beautiful set of figures to own. And you know what, it's this sense of ownership that is also reflected in the character progression system, because each treasure and trinket that you pick up can be used to buy new items, level up your skills, and imbue your gear with game-altering gems. That's right, the game logs your progress, and that means that you can start expanding out in different ways, and acting as a kind of cherry on top of the cherry that was on top of this delicious experience, there's branching narrative options meaning that no two campaigns are going to feel the same. The best part is, is that there's a fail-forward mechanic as well, meaning that even if your party gets wiped, there's a chance that you can advance the overall plot of what's going on in this world and then go on to new missions and not feel like you've wasted a ton of time. That is incredibly important with these types of board games, mitigating failure and making it fun. It's this approach to replayability and granular customization that makes it easy for me to praise this title throughout, and it is definitely something that will be making a firm feature in my regular board game rotation. So yeah, Bardsung is pretty much like a loud siren call to board game fanatics like myself, with its amazing amount of customization, its incredibly lengthy campaign offering, and the fact that it looks just so bloody beautiful, it's hard not for me to sing Bardsung's praises. But there we go, that's been my first impressions of Bardsung. Let me know what you thought about it down in the comments section below and whether or not you're going to be supporting this on Kickstarter, because I'd love to hear your opinions on it. Steamforged makes great games, and I am very, very sure that this is going to be another smash hit. But yeah, like I said, tell me all about it down below. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me over on Twitter at RetroJ with a zero. But until then, my friends, treat yourself with love and respect, and I'll speak to you soon. Peace.